Thank you. Thank you. I am like um, to explain to you what happened like two days after 9-11. I'm going to tell you what our taking place in we don't have a clue we were talking about what that means for china what it means for qatar what it means for the muslim brotherhood Pakistan, china russia Iran. We have no clue. The United States defeated after the Russians were defeated. Russians defeated I'll come to the history in a minute. I'll talk about it. We have no clue what is going to happen in the coming 10 years. All we know is that we sent Float of history. Something really, really big happened over the last month. Something that will determine your political future. The world will not be the same after what happened. Something really big happened. While we talk, while we're here tonight, diplomats are making over hours. Diplomats from Russia visiting Pakistan, visiting China, visiting the Taliban, visiting the Iran, visiting the Russia. It's actually doing the same thing. The Europeans are doing the same thing. Everybody's flying everywhere talking, trying to make sense, trying to see what is next, how to respond, how are we going to go about responding to the victory of the Taliban. What does that mean for us in Germany, for us in Europe, for us in Islam? What does it mean to us? What does it mean to the US? What does it mean to terrorism, political violence? What does it mean to Al-Qaeda? What does it mean to ISIS? We have no clue. While we are here tonight, we don't know. We will know in maybe one year. I don't know. So it's a guess. So what you do when you don't know, you turn around and look at it. Maybe a history can tell us something. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. Because history seldom repeats itself. But it does give you some indication of what you made. Because history will tell you a bit about what happened in the last something about. So what I'm saying here, what I'm telling you. It. Rent it, don't take it as it's true. Because maybe I'm wrong. What would have happened if we happened 20 years later in the end? If we understand in 9 11 that the US is going to Afghanistan and try Al Qaeda and the Taliban, and then fail in 20 years later. If we did that, we don't know. Of course not. We didn't see it coming. So do we know what is going to happen in the next five, six, seven, eight, seven, twenty years? No, we don't know. But let's try and make sense of what happened on the basis of. Is there anybody from Afghanistan in the room? Anybody from that region? 
Anybody from the region? Anybody from that region? No. I'm going to take you to that region. This is Afghanistan here. Afghanistan squeezed between Iran, Pakistan. Squeeze. Iran as a major player. No. <laughs> Is that better? Okay. Iran sort of marginal in the Middle East. We'll, we'll, we'll look into the Middle East and we'll look into what Afghanistan means to the Middle East and what Pakistan, Iran, what the developments were over the last 40 years. I can go back to the invasion of the Arabs into the Middle East 1400 years ago. We could go back to the colonial period if you want. I chose to go back 40 years. Why? Because I think 40 years ago, what happens today can be explained on the basis of what happened 40 years ago. We're talking 79. In 79, there was, we were still enemies with you. <laughs> we didn't like you at the time. We didn't like you either. <laughs> Where's Romania? We didn't like you either. I'm sorry. We like you today. Cold War. Now, not many of you were born when it was when we had the Cold War. It wasn't very cold, by the way. We call it cold, but it wasn't cold. It was extremely hot in Vietnam, in Angola, in Mozambique, South Africa, in most parts of Latin America. We called it cold because it was cold. <laughs> where we lived, that's what they call white supremacy. Uh, we won't talk about white supremacy tonight. <laughs> no, that's for some other day. Sorry you, for no, you're welcome. <laughs> are, you, are you by any chance from Afghanistan? No. I, <laughs> <laughs> then go back and find someone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah find somebody from <laughs> Afghanistan for us. <laughs> Thank you. Cold War. Now, it wasn't very cold, but we called it cold because it was cold on our side. The world was divided easy. The, the world was very simple. It was during my youth. My life was very easy when I was young. There was one side, other side. It was black and white, easy. You were either one side on your side, <laughs> or you were on my side. My side, our side, the Dutch, US, Western Europe was capitalism. We had a model, a model that we exported into the world, and we were convinced that that model would rule the world with time. And then there was some other system. We call it Marxism, socialism, whatever you frame it. And the two opposed. You were either the one or the other. There was no middle road. Yeah, there were some non-aligned aligned nations, but they were few. Most of them, most of the nations, most of the countries, most of the governments made their choice, picked their favorite. You were aligned with the US, capitalism, liberalism, modernity, market, or you aligned with the socialist, equality, rights-based, people's government, and whatnot. The two opposed. They met here and there. Vietnam is an interesting example. South Africa is the other interesting example. They met where they met. They collided. They killed because the one couldn't live with the other. 
And while the US was trying to get their influence through the CIA and covert actions and taking out people and killing people, while the USSR was doing the same thing in other places, in 1979, two very dramatic things happened in this region. Two things happened. I accidentally was in the region, but that has got nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> something very dramatic happened in Iran, and very, something very dramatic happened in Afghanistan. Let's look at Iran first. There was a revolution in Iran. A revolution, you could even call it a popular uprising. The people revolted against the government was the Shah of Iran, capitalist, modern, like, what's his name again in Turkey? No, no, <laughs> Ataturk. He was a friend of Ataturk. Modernity, he introduced modernity. He was the modern example of a capitalist modern leader. He didn't come from nowhere. The Shah in Persia was put there by force, by killing, by the CIA as a puppet of the United States. He didn't come there accidentally. The Shah in Persia was put there by the CIA. The people revolted, 1979, revolution. We were all surprised, we didn't see it coming. The revolt, the revolution in Iran was orchestrated by, they're still there, the Ayatollah, religious leaders. It was a religious revolution against the capitalist puppets from the United States in a time where you were either communist or capitalist. Something new happened. U.S. Embassy left under very unpleasant, tragic circumstances. Up to today, the relations between the US and Iran are disturbed. Happened in 1979. It all started in 1979. The uprise of the Islamic revolutionary forces in Iran established. Welcome. I'm not going to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. In 1979, the present day, today's tensions between Iran and the US started. 40 years today, tension. It was never resolved. A religiously motivated revolution in Iran against a capitalist force that was imposed on the Iranians by the United States to protect Iran from a potential invasion of communist forces. 40 years today, and it's still there. Accidentally, or maybe on purpose, that same, that very same year, oh, by the way, I, I almost forget to tell you that the clergy that orchestrated the revolution in Iran, the Ayatollahs are still there, were supported by the United States when they were trying to get the Shah in place in Iran. So they were supported by the US. But then when the revolution happened, that obviously wasn't very helpful in the relationship with the United States. So the anger between the United States 
and Iran that is still there today, started 40 years ago. Question? I was just saying, I'm from the US, we have a bad habit of, <laughs> of that happening, of arming people and then... Oh my God, there's more coming. There's, <laughs> <laughs> you're still gonna leave if you want. <laughs> there's, there's much more coming. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, did, I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> okay. It's the very same year I was in the region, but no relation. <laughs> I'm not very sure. <laughs> the very same year, the Russians decided, this is the Cold War where you're, you're either for the Russians or you're against the Russians. And then the Russians decide to invade a nation. This is, you, you can hardly imagine how dramatic and politically sensitive that was. It was like an avalanche. It was like, hey, revolution in Iran, Russians invade Afghanistan. Oh my. Who? And they're obviously going for the coast. They're going for the coast. They're going for Karachi. They want to get access to ports. Now, the US, in that Cold War period, obviously couldn't let that happen. They couldn't just let Afghanistan move into a different position in that Cold War. So they started to look and identify oppositional forces. We're already getting very close to where we are today. The oppositional forces in Afghanistan were what we now know as the Mujahideen. The Mujahideen opposed from a religious perspective, not from a political perspective other than the religiously motivated uh, value system, they opposed the communist system. Also, and it, I think it's important to understand what happens next, also from a anti-colonial, anti-imperial perspective. The anti-colonial, anti-imperial perspective has always been part of the motivational factors for the Mujahideen and everything that is related to it. Okay, so the Mujahideen started to oppose the Russians present in Afghanistan from 1979. The US started to support. You can find online pictures of the Mujahideen being received by the president and the White House as freedom fighters. Literally, you Google Mujahideen White House, you'll find Mujahideen being honored the US as freedom fighters in Afghanistan. The support for the Mujahideen came in millions, hundreds of millions, cash, weapons, material, political. They were supported big time, not a little bit serious support. And it may seem a detail, but it's really important. That assistance, that help, the US channeled this through Pakistan. This is extremely important to understand what is happening today. The Pakistani government was helping the United States to channel their assistance, their military equipment, their weapons, their money into Afghanistan Mujahideen. So the, Pakist the Pakistanis picked 
they were friends. They said, okay, now we've got some money here, $200 million. Shall we give it to him or shall we give it to him? And they obviously chose to give it to their friends. So the Pakistanis financed their friends, the Mujahideen, with the American money in Afghanistan to oppose the communist Marxist Russian invasion in that region during the Cold War. The picture starts to emerge, isn't it? We're getting some ingredients of what is happening in Afghanistan, Pakistan today. The Mujahideen, after 10 years of fighting, intense fighting, won the war. Russians left, 89. 1989, the Russians left Afghanistan. They lost a major battle in this region. Where is the region? The Russians, this is Uzbekistan, the stance, Turkmenistan, is all part of the USSR. It's all part of the US, uh, USSR Russian influence. So they were trying to expand into Afghanistan to go to Karachi, to get access to the sea, to the port, and they failed. They failed because the, the Mujahideen defeated them. 1989, the Russians retreated. Many people, many analysts, political analysts, will tell you that that was the start of the end of the USSR. Their defeat in Afghanistan was the start, I repeat, let that sink in. The Russian defeat in Afghanistan was the beginning of the end of the USSR as a political system. Thirty years ago. Just a second. The Mujahideen attracted a phenomenon into Afghanistan that we know today as foreign fighters. We know the phenomenon from Syria, ISIS, foreign terrorist fighters. The foreign terrorist fighters in ISIS, in the Middle East, isn't the first time that happened. It also happened in Afghanistan in the, during the Cold War through the system of the Mujahideen. They came from Bosnia, they came from Algeria, they came from Yemen, they came from all over the planet. And they came to Afghanistan to help and assist the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. They defeated the Russians. Please. And uh, you said that the defeat of the USSR was the end of the USSR in Afghanistan. I said it or a bit. Did Masamana say so? What, what are the factors that make people say so? Well, the cost of the war was enormous. The uh, political, um, how do you say that, implications in public support for the USSR as a system was important. But it wasn't the only factor. There was, it, there was an economic issue. There was, there was uh, Chernobyl. There was, so there were several issues. But the defeat in Afghanistan and the public support base for the USSR system and the, and the, and the economic cost of the war, all of that made the, uh, that it was, it was seen as the beginning, the start of the implosion of the USSR. Yes, please. Can you repeat one more time what the USSR was? Okay, the USSR was the communist bloc, Eastern okay. Europe. So led by uh, Moscow, and the USSR was the, the sphere of influence of the, of the Russian state into their 
um, how do you say that, satellite states. So Eastern Europe, uh, the stands, you know, it was, they had satellites as, you know, as a system where they were influential. It wasn't, so there was a central state, Moscow, uh, Russia, and they had satellites that weren't free to choose in the Cold War what system they wanted because they were, it was on, it imposed on them. So the USSR is the, uh, I don't even know what the official term stands for, USSR. Soviet Republic, the Socialist Soviet Republic. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. I didn't say divert. I didn't use the word divert. Choose. I said choose. Yes. No, they chose to 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 finance um, factions within the Mujahideen that were sympathetic towards the Pakistani army or the Pakistani regime, or inverse, they chose to um, to finance certain groups within the Mujahideen uh, system that became sympathetic because of the of the support. But they they created links between the Mujahideen and the Pakistani government and the Pakistan by, by giving them money, which was given to them by the U it came in suitcases. And then it was handed over to the Pakistanis because the US didn't want their, you know, their fingerprints on it. So the, and then the Pakistanis would get the, the suitcases, thank you very much, and then would travel into the, the, the quarters of the Mujahideen and give it to the people that they, you know, became friends with because they were supporting them. And the Mujahideen. Yes, exactly, exactly. Personal link created by money given to them by others. That was that is what happened, and it's still relevant in today's world. Um, Nineteen eighty-nine, Mujahideen victory. Now, this wasn't the end of disasters and tragedies in Afghanistan. But it was the beginning of what we call today Al-Qaeda. The Mujahideen, the winners of Afghanistan, supported by the United States through Pakistan, left Afghanistan, went back from fighters to Bosnia, Algeria, in Yemen, spread over the world, created cells, created divisions of Mujahideen in different places. This is why we have an Al-Qaeda in Algeria today, an Al-Qaeda in Yemen today, and sleeping cells in Bosnia. They left Afghanistan after the victory. They celebrated the victory. Very much the same as the Taliban were celebrating their victory last week. The foreign fighters went back and started to organize themselves. In Afghanistan itself, the departure of the Russians led to a major, major civil war, 10% of the Afghani population died in a period of five years. Seven, sorry. In a period of seven years, 10% of the population got victim of the civil war. It was, there's no words for it. It was terrible. That war, that civil war between different groups in the society, in the Afghan society, they were all trying to get access to power, influence, money. That war was won, here they're coming, by the Taliban. 
Who are these Taliban? Who are they? The Taliban are the people that are raised, born, raised in the refugee camps of Afghanis that fled the country during the Russian invasion, the Russian occupation, and that fled into Pakistan and Iran. There were madrasas, there were schools, there was a certain type of education. They wanted to liberate Afghanistan. They wanted to go back after the war. This is the Afghani Palestinian Liberation Organization, PLO. This is the Afghani version of the PLO. They wanted to go back to Afghanistan and liberate their country from the refugee camps in Pakistan and Iran. Guess who was supporting them? Pakistan, maybe? Yes, Pakistan. Now, there's, a, there's a, a, a bit of a complex political reasoning behind this, because Pakistan needs a religiously motivated Islamic government on their west side, because they're at war with the Indians, with India. And this is, you know, the, the tensions between Islam, and uh, I, I won't go into the details, but the, the tensions between the Islam and, and other religions in India is, is, is existential. This is why there is a Pakistan. There is a Pakistan because they, they, they left India for religious reasons. So they cannot accept something else but an Islamic state on their west side. One of the mistakes that has been made, but it's a detail, but it's important. One of the mistakes made in the last 20 years is that the government in Kabul, Ashraf Ghani and others, were supported by India. And the Pakistanis didn't like it. So the Pakistanis supported the Taliban born and raised in the um, refugee camps, wanted to liberate the country, wanted to go back. They went back and restored stability and security. From 1996, no, sorry, from 1989, no, sorry, from 1996 onward, the Taliban were in power in Afghanistan, People that you talk to from Afghanistan, you ask them the question, what was good during Taliban rule? They will tell you it was safe and secure. The same thing happens today. The same thing happens today. You ask the Afghani, is there an advantage of having the Taliban back? And they will tell you, yes. It is more safe than it used to be. The Taliban are very bad in some things, in many things, but they're good in one thing, no, in two things. They're good in security, they're, dis they're good in discipline. They don't accept undisciplined behavior. And they're very good in suppressing the poppy culture drugs in the years 1996 until 2001 when the taliban ruled afghanistan there was no drug production reason why iran was extremely happy with the taliban they kept poppy production at a very low level anyhow so there were they restored stability and security, and they violated human rights for most of the people. At least 50%, <laughs> if not more, probably more. OK, so civil war, Taliban, Taliban accepted by the international community. They, didn't, they never got a seat in the UN system. They were not recognized. They were the par pariah, you say that? Is that British? Pariah, you say that? Of the world. 
everybody hated them. Very important for the state of mind today. In the years until that famous day 20 years ago, the Mujahideen spread across the world and started to prepare for their big day. They started to organize themselves. I didn't even mention Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> By <laughs> they started to organize themselves and started to get ready to enter the world stage. Remember, I said the Mujahideen, their agenda was anti colonial, anti imperialistic. So it wasn't necessarily only anti um, US, it was anti colonial, anti-imperialistic, in it still is. Al-Qaeda's ideology is anti-colonial. So for them, the US was as much an enemy as the USSR. Europe, for the Mujahideen, is as much an enemy as the USSR. They distinguish the far enemy and the near enemy. The far enemy is the US, USSR, the Europeans, the Westerners, if you want. The near enemy is every ruler in the Arab world that works, cooperates with the West. So the kingdom, Mubarak, you name it, the king of Jordan. Those are the enemies of the Mujahideen slash Al-Qaeda. And then 9-11. Boom. Boom. 9-11, as I said in my first introductory remarks, is very similar in its impact is what we've seen in the last couple of days. Everything changed on that day. Because on 9-11, instead of having a bipolar world between Marxism, communism, and socialism, USSR on one side, capitalism, modernity, market on the other side, all of a sudden, there was something else that started in Iran with the revolution that sort of continued with the Mujahideen in Pakistan and suddenly presented itself to the globe with a big, here we are, 9-11 on that dramatic day in New York and Washington. Suddenly, that nobody had ever, not nobody, but very few people were aware of the existence of a Osama bin Laden Al-Qaeda player. Yes, of course, there was the Taliban Al-Qaeda monitoring team in, the, in New York. There were attacks on the embassy in Tanzania, yes. There was an attack in Yemen, yes, but nobody really took that seriously. Only a few people in New York, in, in the US intelligence people. But for the general public and for most politicians, in the political reality before 9-11, religious fundamentalism and the religious players that said, hey, wait, wait, there's us. Hey, look at us. Count us in. We're also a voice. It's not just 
Marxism and socialism and capitalism. No, there's a third way. And the third way is religious. And it's a value system. It is a governance system. It is a legal system. Wake up. It's a wake up call. <laughs> 9-11 is a wake up call. <laughs> I'm with you, Brad. We're here. <laughs> There's more to it than economics. There's more to it than socialism. There is something else, and it's religious, and it's called Islam. And we believe that now that we've defeated the colonial imperial powers in Russia, we're now going to defeat the colonial and imperial powers in the US and Europe will get you 9-11. Now, people from my generation, people that are old enough to have witnessed it, all remember where we were, what happened on that day. I was personally, I was responsible for the Dutch government's response to crisis in the world humanitarian and political crisis. So I was heading the crisis management um, response mechanism of the Dutch government in the international, in the foreign affairs, foreign affairs. So they said, Peter, what are you going to do? <laughs> hey, <laughs> I said, hey, you know, I'll talk to you in the morning. <laughs> we didn't know. Of course, there was the immediate you know, aftermath, the victims, you know, the, the, the fire, the, you know, that was the immediate, uh, uh, you know, do, should we still fly? Should we clean the skies? Should we, you know, what, how do we protect our, our, our infrastructure? Are there, are, there, are there maybe, is there the possibility of an attack in, in, in Amsterdam or in London? You know, you need to protect, blah, blah, blah. You know, that immediate. But the long-term implications of what happened, we were struggling to get our hands around it, 9-11. Now, 20 years later, we know much more about what that has meant. Securitization is everywhere. We look through the world, we look through a security lens at everything in the world, whether it's money that flows, there is security risk, is it used for financing of terrorism? Whether it's Boarding a plane, hey, be careful, protect it. Before 9-11, you probably, you probably don't realize, but before 9-11, we weren't checked when we went on a plane. There was no, nothing. Nothing. You just entered the plane. Protective measures, security measures. Migration is a security risk these days. Before 9-11, it was migration. <laughs> People move. Remember? <laughs> People move. Now it's, hey, hey. And there's Muslims, and there's foreign fighters, and there's, hey, maybe there's Taliban amongst the, hey. We look at migration from a security perspective. We look at everything. There's cameras all up. There were no cameras before 9-11. Nowhere. No, not inside, but outside. Well, I get into elevators where there's <laughs> camera. That nothing of that kind was there before 9/11. Our world is securitized. 9/11. Everything became a risk. Your waste, tea. they may use it. Chemicals, they may use it. Nothing of that kind was there before 9-11. And also, we didn't look at religion as a political force, as a political factor. Religion was something private, something that people do. They go to churches, they go to mosques. You know, it's a private thing. Today, 
religion is a political issue. There's a mosque in Rotterdam. Hey, be careful. What do they preach there? What do people say there? Hey, you need to be careful. Religion is securitized. It's a political and security issue. And it's only been 20 years. In those, in those 20 years, in those two decades, our whole world became securitized and religion became politicized. It's just to say that we have no clue today what the implications are of the next victory of the Taliban over the United States in Afghanistan. Okay. 2001. I promise you it was going to get worse. <laughs> Are you ready for it? <laughs> it's coming. Eh? I'm, I'm just warning you. <clears throat> they attack us, we attack them. Pooh. Revenge. Easy. We'll hunt them. Was it, wasn't it what they said? We'll hunt them down, we'll smoke them out. Something of that, Something of that nature. Those were the, you're either with us or you're against us. Back to the old tradition of us and them. I've got friends who said, okay, if that's my choice, then I know where I am. I'm against it. You use that language, it works. People choose. You're either with me or you're against me. Okay, I'll choose. So people choose, chose. Al-Qaeda, the strength of an estimated couple of hundred people, maybe a thousand worldwide before 9-11, after 9-11, and the language that was used afterwards the, 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 in the direct aftermath, it exploded. People were dancing in the streets in Vietnam, in Mali, in the Middle East, in many diverse places. People celebrated the victory of Al-Qaeda over a superpower. We don't realize this, but many people considered it a big victory. So the US went into Afghanistan and invaded the country. The next 10 years, Al-Qaeda used to build up their franchise. You see franchise coming up all over the planet, be it in Palestine, be it in Yemen, be it in Indonesia, be it in Afghanistan, be it in um, uh, Bangladesh. So Al-Qaeda used those 10 years, the first 10 years after 9-11, to build up their imperium. And then something, I don't know what word I should use. Something really dramatic happens. For some reason that we may never know, the United States decided to invade Iraq. According to the United States, that was part of the war against Al-Qaeda. Now, I want you to look at this map. And have a proper understanding of what happened when the US invaded Iraq. A Shia state at war really very, um, um, how do you say that? Violent wars between Iraq and Iran. Those two are enemies. Syria, Lebanon are friends with Iran. Because of the US invasion, 
Iraq changed from a Sunni dominated Saddam Hussein state to a Shia majority ruled country. Iraq got into the other camp. That today, in understanding what is going to happen next, because of what happened in Afghanistan, is extremely important. The Iranian Revolutionary Forces now in Iraq, in Syria, it wasn't easy in Syria, we'll come to that in a minute, and in Lebanon. This chain was closed. Capital, Baghdad, Damascus, Tehran, and Hezbollah connected. The people in Saudi Arabia, the Sunni dominated Arabs in Saudi Arabia got really nervous. And we know what that did. The nervousness in Saudi Arabia and the Shia domination in Iraq as a result of the US invasion created the opposition in Iraq, now known as ISIS, a Sunni opposition to the Shia domination in this region. This region, Shia dominated region, suddenly, the Saudi Arabia couldn't accept that, so started to support an opposition in Iraq. We call it ISIS, Sunni opposition to Shia domination. ISIS became attractive to the youth because they created the state Caliphate, foreign fighters, 40,000 foreign fighters flocked into it. Saudi Arabia opened the doors of their prisons and said, you want to do something nice in your life, go to Iraq. Turkey supported for other, she's now gone, the Turkish amongst us is gone. <laughs> Turkey's had their own reasons to support ISIS. ISIS became the opposition to Al-Qaeda. You look at what happens in Afghanistan today, ISIS, Al-Qaeda are oppositional forces. They oppose one another. Okay. It will get worse. I'll leave this, you know. What, what,
nuclear war there. It's uh, Pakistan uh, trying to support some revolutionary forces here. So it's all, you know, it's a, hey, nobody really knows what to do and how to do You know, it's in, in, how do you say that? Nervous, politically nervous. In that political nervosity, and I'm going to go a bit fast in, in, with the eye on the watch. Maybe I shouldn't take too much time here. So I jumped. I jumped to today. In that nervosity, we, you know, meanwhile, we had the defeat of ISIS. The caliphate was destroyed, but they're still there. We had a revolutionary state in Sudan. There is increases, increasing presence of ISIS in this part of Africa. So they're, they're still re-emerging re, uh, in Africa. So there's, you know, there, there's a lot of other details. But let, let me jump to where we are today. All of a sudden, in this... sort of confused region where democracy or democratic forces are fighting with fundamentalist religious forces and everybody's trying to position themselves. There's Qatar with their Muslim Brotherhood that used to have friends in Turkey and other places, but then, you know, got isolated by the Saudis and by the West. So suddenly Afghanistan falls into the hands of the Taliban. Now look at the map. Look at what happened. Turkey, friends of the Muslim Brotherhood, Qatar, central position. They're now all of a sudden friends with the Taliban. They're now uh, recognizing the Taliban regime. They're, they're opening the airport in Kabul. They're now on top of the world, suddenly. So it's Qatar. Iran, friends with the Taliban, suddenly. Pakistan, friends with the Taliban. So we've got Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Damascus, Turkey. Poof! Religiously motivated politics in a whole region from the Middle East into the central part of Asia from last week. It's all brand new. With Qatar, that was put in isolation a couple of years ago. Remember that the Middle East said, Qatar, you're no longer welcome. We're going to isolate you because you're Muslim. Today, they're opening the airport in, in Kabul. They are the friends with the Taliban. And here is the real major issue, because if, as if this is not enough, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Damascus, Turkey, they're now joined by Russia and China. Russia and China have said, okay, Taliban, We'll recognize them. We can work with them. We can make sense. So the defeat of the US in Afghanistan has brought together a whole range of Islamic run countries based on religion in that region. It has brought together and cemented their cooperation and friendship in a whole range in the Middle East and Central Asia. And those are supported by China and Russia, the newcomers on the world stage. And the losers are the United States, Europe, is confused, <laughs> doesn't know what to do. 
So you get that out of the YouTube thing. <laughs> Erase that part. <laughs> You're, you know, it's like, hey, so, so where do we go, you know? And what that is going to mean for Saudi Arabia, the uh, Omans of this world, the Dubais of this world, we don't know. We'll have to see. We'll have to wait and see. But it has changed dramatically very fundamentally to set up the architecture of a big chunk of the planet. It has what started in 1979 in Iran, the opposition Shah, a revolution based on fundamentalist religious inspiration. It has empowered that frame in Afghanistan, supported by forces around it. And for international power reasons, supported by those who wanted to oppose the United States anyway, the Russians and the Chinese. The world will be different from now on. And I'll repeat what I said when I started. What that means, ask me in five years. I'm not going to make the same mistake and tell you what that means immediately. It will take years for us, for the dust to settle down for everybody, for all those diplomats and all those ambassadors and all those politicians and all those people that travel the world today and try to talk to one another and try to take a position in that new, you know, setup, the new architecture of the world and see how they position themselves. Firstly, towards the Taliban itself, but then secondly, of course, in that new setup that will emerge from the victory of the Taliban. <clears throat> it will empower those who fight in um, military terms, in call it terrorism, call it violence. But those who fight that war will feel empowered by it, will feel that the victory, as much as the victory over the over the USSR in 1989, empowered the Mujahideen. This will empower those who fight on the basis of a religious motive. It will empower those who feel that religion is the inspiration for politics, a for It will reduce the human rights perspective in international politics, it will reduce the call for democracy, it will reduce civil powers as a for politics, and it will empower those who oppose that. It's not going to be easy. For those who believe in human rights, dignity, women's rights, the times ahead are not going to be easy because of those people holding each other's hands and coming together and feeling that they've won. They've won the next battle. And they've won a battle that has been going on 
for 40 years. Is that a final victory? We don't know. Will the securitization that we started 20 years ago, if the securitization that we started 20 years ago will fit into that new political narrative and the new political paradigms, then we've got a serious problem. Because securitization, cameras that keep an eye on you wherever you go, whether it's an elevator or you sit in your car and the camera is there to recognize your face. Or as in China, you'll cross the street while the traffic light is in red and the camera will register your name. Securitization. If that securitization is being exploited by those powers that want to suppress women, opponents, anybody who's got a different opinion, I hear you, you go to jail. I don't know if that is a true story, but I hear you go to jail in Afghanistan today if you don't have a beard. Now, if you, it doesn't simply don't, doesn't grow, then you, you'll be in jail forever. <laughs> it's sad, but it's, it, I hear it's true. If securitization that we started 20 years ago is going to be used in the hands of oppressive regimes, that have won a battle and that try to oppress at least 50% of the population, if not more, then the, we have created a world that isn't necessarily much better. Let me, let me put it this way. I'm a little bit concerned. Thank you. I, 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 said, I, 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 I was going to say, I, I'm, I'm going to spend the night in Groningen. So that we've got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about time. <laughs> sure. Right. So um, to my knowledge, in the Middle East, uh, there's currently two camps. I would say it's about Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. Yes. They're probably on the same side, and then you have Turkey, Iraq, and Qatar, sometimes also Iran, on the other side. Yes. Currently, Turkey is already selling drones to Libya, Ukraine, Poland, Iraq and Qatar. Qatar and Turkey, they're kind of aligned on Afghanistan. They're both trying to already get economic influence. Yes. Do you think we'll see uh, Turkish or Qatari drone strikes on Islamic State Kandahar province positions in Afghanistan? Or is that still going to be a while from now? I, I didn't go into the specifics of ISIS. ISIS is, is, is gaining momentum and terrain in, in Africa, in sub saharan Africa. Uh, not, not a little bit, big time. Um, in Afghanistan, they, they're, 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 they're small, and they're not in a, an accepted player, by the, nor by the Taliban, nor by Al-Qaeda, nor by the Iranians. So, th so they're not, they don't have a support base in Asia. So will they be, and Russia and China obviously <laughs> don't want ISIS <laughs> You know, to be in uh, Afghanistan or supported by the Taliban. So is support, ISIS doesn't have a, a, a very strong support base in that region. Uh, so do they, do they stand a chance to survive in Afghanistan? I, I am very doubtful. And do you think uh, they'll have air support from Turkey and Qatar? ISIS? No. Uh, no, the Taliban will have the air support. Do you think they will? Yes, very likely. Yes, very likely. But I'm, you know, I'm not worried about ISIS. I'm not so much worried about ISIS. Famous last words. 
Let me put it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I do not think that we should be too much worried about ISIS in Afghanistan for the reasons I mentioned. Nobody is supportive of ISIS in Afghanistan. Uh, the, the Taliban are not, um, uh, Al-Qaeda is not, uh, they, they, they find that their, their, their space, it's their space. So, and, and the Russians don't want it, and the Stans don't want it. So the, the Turkmenistan, the Uzbekistans don't want ISIS in Afghanistan. So I'm not worried about ISIS in Afghanistan. Okay. Somebody will find a solution, and whether that's drones or other weapons, Any other questions? Yes. Um, I remember seeing Saddam Hussein's name on the presentation. I just wanted to know what role he plays in the conflict. What version do you want? <laughs> Which version you want? Um, Saddam Hussein wasn't, to my knowledge, an Islamic fundamentalist force in the Middle East. I don't think he was. He was obviously anti-Kurdish, you know, for his own reasons and for, you know, domestic and internal reasons. Um, and he was obviously very much opposed to Iran. You know, he was a very anti-Iranian but he came out of the tradition of the socialist movement in the Middle East. Rather, he was rather a Bahatist than anything else. So he wasn't, he, he was in a different school of thought in political terms. But obviously there were people that thought differently, had a different idea about it. Any other questions? Yes, please. I just feel like this will affect the Chinese uh, control global trade and the Well, the, the, the answer is in your question. <laughs> They've got the money. They've got the money. They've got the funds. So they invest. And then in those places where they can play that game, they invest and then ask for return on their investment. And when the governments are not capable of paying the return on their investment, then they ask for a military basis. That's how they do it. So they militarize their assistance. So they're 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 gaining influence all over, and they're they're very strong in Pakistan, very strong. So they've got access to 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 Pakistan, Pakistani resources, um, and they and they and they they play their game with the Pakistanis. They obviously don't want Pakistan to be a basis for support of their Uyghurs. So there is an Uyghur support, uh, what you call, um, um, concern on the, on the Chinese side. But other than that, their, their inspiration for their assistance and, and their presence nationally is more economic than anything else. And they're, they're, they're increasing the military setup in the world. They, you know, economic from their, you know, the. I the, think that the Taliban are impactful on your force. If you're, you should counter the second economic demands, then when you say that it's a general China, I mean, especially when you have the Chinese treatment of religious minorities in Western China. So, I mean, what do you believe that the Taliban would eventually change its views with cooperation? Sorry, I, I, I didn't get that last part. It's like, do you think the Taliban will eventually change their status, their relationship with China on the same thing? 
Then the, 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 the Taliban and the Mujahideen are two different factions. Eh? They're not the same thing. Yeah, the Mujahideen is something else. Mujahideen is what started off as, as Mujahideen to, to fight the Russians and then became Al Qaeda. So they, 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 they slowly but, but, but uh, eventually uh, turned into an Al Qaeda fighting force. So, so, and the Taliban have a national agenda in Afghanistan. They are the, the people that were raised and born in the, in, the, in the refugee camps in Pakistan and partly in Iran were, 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 were prepared to go back into their own country and, and regain their own country based on their religious motives that they, 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 they were taught in the, in the refugee camps in, in Pakistan. So it's a, it's a diff, it's, um, Taliban and, and Mujahideen are two different things. And, and <clears throat> the reasons why China now support the Taliban and the, and the new regime there is not because of their ideological uh, basis, but it's, be, it's to annoy the United States. Yeah. They're not there because they, they, they like the Taliban, but they, they're there because they, they like to annoy the, the US. And, 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 and don't forget, sorry, don't forget that the Chinese have, have, have a lot of revenge in them. 100 years of suppression by the West. There's a lot of that in China. There's a lot of anti-colonial sentiments in China. Those, those barbaric regimes in the West have suppressed our supreme culture for hundreds of years. And we'll find a solution to that. We'll get them. They suppress the, 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 the barbarics from the West, suppress us. And you're going to stop that. So there's an anti-colonial element in, in how the Chinese operate in the world. So in that sense, you know, there's a, they're, they're, they recognize some, some of the anti-colonial sentiments in Al-Qaeda, which is not Taliban, it's not the same thing. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Um, is there a brief way to say kind of if there was direct or indirect support from China uh, in Afghanistan to whatever party? I don't know. The Not that I'm aware of. Like before now supporting the Taliban? Not that I'm aware of. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm not aware of it. Yeah, sure. after, you're, you're after the final one. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting that that Israel sort of disappeared behind behind the horizon in the last twenty years, um, because because the 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 religious inspiration of state building. The way you see it in Saudi Arabia and in, um, in, 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 in Taliban, Afghanistan today, and in uh, Iran is, is of a different nature. So it's, it's a different struggle, it's a different fight. Uh, so the Israeli issue sort of disappeared behind the horizon. It's no longer a real political issue, of course, for the PLO, for the Palestinians and for, you know, the, the, there's obviously, you know, certain people and certain groups in society in the Middle East that are that are still part of that struggle and still still fighting that that war, but it's it's much less than 40 years ago, part of the political setup of the Middle East because something else emerged. We, the Islam, we have a vision of how we should organize the state. And we want to bring that back to our society. And it's a post-Cold War sort of, that started in 1979 in Iran, but it's a post-Cold Cold War sort of new political um, basis. Final, final? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, the European Union is sort of in a predicament now where we have to deal with autocratic regimes, not just in the Middle East, but also in the European Union itself. And we, we struggle to find an answer to that problem here. Now, given the opportunistic nature of China and Russia in, in regards to the Middle East, 
how do you see, uh, like, we need to find an answer to this problem of dealing with autocratic regimes. What could be steps towards such an answer? The answer, I think, yeah, I'm reluctant because, because, you know, we, 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 we struggle with these questions, you know, since the Second World War. So it's, it's something that, you know, keeps us busy, you know, in our intellectual sort of, you know, trying to figure things out since, since the Second World War. Um, but I think the, the answer is in the relation between the state and the citizen. The Westphalian, what was it, 1648, right? 1648. We live with the model since 1648. And maybe the model is no longer applicable. There is something because of new um, media, because of you know the the, the TikTok and the <laughs> and the <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not on TikTok. Uh, <laughs> I don't dance. Yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> I'm still you know I'm still I'm going there. You know. uh, but um, because of the media, because of what is you know the the, the fact that everybody is a, is a news agent and everybody is 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 uh, expressing their opinion on 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 these issues. Um, the relationship between the state the government and the citizen is changing and the westphalian model is no longer maybe useful in our in our today's society then that if that is correct then we need to redesign the state model um so we need you guys to think about that question. How do we redesign the state model given modern communication, um, where everybody's got an opinion and expresses that opinion real time now, now, you know, um, whatever that opinion is. And the Westphalian model wasn't designed for that state of, 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 of affairs. So we're using a model that is no longer fit for the circumstances. But redesigning the Westphalian model is not going to be easy, but we need great minds to do it. I have many more follow-up questions, but uh, thank you. <laughs> um, use use your, your education and your intellectual uh, capital to design it, I'll, I'll sit back in Brussels and wait for it. <laughs> no, but seriously, I, I seriously think that the Westphalian model is, it's time to redesign the Westphalian model. It's no longer fit for um, 2021. Um, and and um, the Taliban, you know, with, with their instant security discipline right wrong this is right in the sharia law if you do something wrong poof here's the consequences very clear cut discipline sort of uh and the chinese are going that down that road you know doing this they're using our securitization uh, model for their disciplined organization of a society where everybody's got an opinion and expresses their uh, opinion. The Russians are doing the same thing. So they're, they are in reinventing the Westphalian model, but not in a manner that is very, um, well, let me put it that way. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not very excited about it. <laughs> uh, and it's not very pleasant, again, you know, for that other 50% of the population. So, so so reinventing that, the U.S. has shown us that there is a need to redefine the, the relation between state and and um, and and the people um, in in a different environment where Twitter de decides on your politics. Something to do. I would
would love to give you a token of appreciation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today, and I would like to give you a little bit of announcement. Uh, this Wednesday, we, uh, we're going to have Confusion Hunt, so if you are interested in part of like, uh, part of social, part of SIP, uh, feel free to sign up. Uh, sign up, please check out on our website and on Facebook events.